Okay, uh, this is River, and uh, just getting the saddle and the reins put on. River does a pretty good job at self-regulating. Self-regulating means, you know, when something is worrying him. He uh, still thinks through things pretty well. I'd, I had tracked all the minutes that we had worked together to get up to this point. And uh, see, that head is really low, with um, even with his spine. And uh, all the minutes put together oh, came out to, I think, at this point was about 22, maybe 23 hours. So I'm going to ask his nose to come in. He's He can actually be pretty soft right now. He's, he's got some resistance. He's going to soften. There, he softened in. But he does a good job at keeping his nose just right in there. I mean, that's just a natural thing that he does. So something I'm going to do is I'm just going to start adding some pressure. I'm like lightly touching my knees on his stomach. I just want to see, you know, how much he's going to move off from me. And so I'm, I'm just being really loud. And I just want to make sure that he, he can soften. Now he... I don't know if you caught that, but he actually tipped his nose into me. And as soon as he did that, I could feel it on the rain. I could feel the rain soften up. And so then I uh, stopped. Horses, all horses are the same. They behave because of the stimulus, but they learn because of the release of the stimulus. So I'm just making sure that he's got an opportunity to self-regulate. Self-regulating is just absolutely critical. That's when we release the stimulus at the right time. It uh, is rewarding self-regulation. Self-regulation is just a horse that can think under pressure. And obviously that's a horse you want to get on. So I'm just giving him a moment to kind of process all of that. I think one of the things that I've learned so much, um, and here I'm at a place uh, called uh, Wes Taylor's Mustang Ranch, and uh, Wes was mentoring me on this first ride. And um, one of the things that, Wes would teach me a lot just over and over drill it into my head and then to make sure it was into my my mind was that uh, what we wanted was a horse that could think under pressure so here I'm just bending him back in I'm waiting for that softness So he's given me pretty good softness in, in the beginning. I mean, he's tipping his nose into me and he's not really, you know, he's not really pulling against it or trying to get away from it. And so when he's real soft like that, then I'm just, I'm just getting louder while I'm inside that pocket or that rider's groove as I'm standing in there. Sometimes they call it the well. And I just want him to get soft, self-regulate, even if I'm hopping around. You know, a lot of times people get in the saddle and they, they're not too aware of where their feet are at. And they might uh, bump him with their boots or drag their foot across his, his hindquarters or accidentally knee him in the ribs or something like that. So I'm just, 
I'm just making sure that all that stuff is pretty good. Yo, know, this is a lot of the, uh, sorry, it's pretty early in the morning right now uh, as I'm reviewing this video. I haven't watched this video in 18 months or so. But I thought I'd just upload it. It's a good video. So here, you know, I get to get all loud and jumpy and everything. And he's not going to move anywhere. Now, partly is I've got his nose tipped in. And so his hind quarters, they would have to walk through that wall. And River's a pretty magical horse, but he's not that magical. And so he, you know, that obviously, though, if he felt a tremendous amount of pressure, he'd just explode out of there. So... It's still huge credit to his ability to self-regulate when he's when he's kind of got, uh, you know, kind of like us when we get between a rock and a hard spot. It's like the best thing we can do is just slow down and think through it. And River did a great job with that. So, you know, you the classic principle of good horsemanship, what you do to one side, you do to the other. The horses are limbic creatures, and so they don't have they don't have a great sense of generalization. That's what the psychologists call that in the human cortex. You know, if you've got your your limbic system and then you've also got your your cortex, your prefrontal cortex and your neocortex, which is maybe what they call the intelligent brain or the thinking brain. And with a big old cortex, you know, we humans have the ability to generalize really well. Meaning if something happens to me on my right side and I didn't die from it and I was okay with it, well, then that probably means that if it happens on my left side, I'm going to get the same results. Horses can't generalize very well because they're predominantly limbic creatures with just a sliver of a, of a uh, prefrontal cortex. So it's not that they don't have one, it's just that it's extremely tiny in comparison to the rest of their brain ratio. As humans, it's completely the opposite. So that's why you do one thing to one side and do it to the other. Is you're helping with their generalization or their lack of generalization. So again, I just want to bump around into him and just kind of see, can he self-regulate? Now, when you're bumping into him, you start out small. And, uh, you know, then I'm going to get louder and louder. So I'm trying to find where his threshold is. I don't want to go very much above that threshold. In fact, I just want to go just a tinch above it. See him self-regulating. You can always tell that the horse is self-regulating when they've got soft ears, which are those ears that are like rotated back about 45 degree angle. A low head, which is typically even with their spine. Soft eyes. Um, soft eyes looks like they're just blinking a lot. So you, if you got a blinking horse, you've got a thinking horse. And you'll see the difference between them just blinking and them like, getting soft eyes blinking they'll blink a lot so I'm just making sure that stirrups and everything are set right and good you know might slap those stirrups around just a bit bump them around a little bit see how he's doing You'll see when they step out of the uh, the state of self-regulation, which you could also say is the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. That's rest, relax, digest. It's where calm and confidence comes from. So when you're moving around, when I'm moving around and I'm getting all loud and I'm putting my feet in the stirrups and bumping into him and all that stuff, obviously I'm going to be taking him out of the parasympathetic nervous system and into the sympathetic nervous system. So once we get into a nervous, the sympathetic gets activated in us. It's the same way it get act activates in the horse. The muscles start tightening up. 
starts getting worried about things, cortisol, adrenaline, you know, start getting produced, and that starts running through the, through the, uh, bloodstream, and so you don't want to get a whole bunch of that running in the bloodstream, or else you don't, you won't get a thinking horse, so that's why the release is so important, because the cortisol and the adrenaline stops being produced in the horse they start to self-regulate and they self-regulate with dopamine and if you give enough time you can get some serotonin in there so that's going to balance out the uh, neurochemical state of the horse so that's why I step away just give him some space to find some safety I've found just over and over and over the only the only question the only real question that a horse ever asks and they ask with the movement of their feet is am i safe i think it's the only thing a horse actually cares about and and is really concerned about is his own safety so you see i'm just i'm just kind of getting up above that threshold and getting a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger but I like stepping out um, as far as I'm stepping out away from him see him dropping his head down just to give him it helps them particularly with with this horse he self-regulates much faster if I step out a little bit further than you might normally would think to do So that's an example of, uh, you know, if he really wants to get away, he can get away, even if he's pinned against that, that wall and, or standing close to that wall. But you just hold on to the reins. You know, I tried to, I tried to hustle to keep up with him so I'm not tugging on those reins. I don't want to be pulling on him and have me, you know, go have him dragging me with, with those reins. That's that's uh, obviously not going to be good and comfortable for him. But you can see how quickly he's self-regulated even after that. His tail's just swishing like it's more concerned with flies than anything else. That head is real low. So that's another interesting thing about um, the horse being a limbic mind predominantly is that in the limbic system, they're only thinking about the this very moment. They're only in the now. And so he's not thinking about what happened, you know, five seconds ago or five minutes ago, and he's not worried about what's happening five minutes from now or, you know, or future tripping. He's just right here in the now. And when you're right here in the now, all you care about is am I safe now? And so doing lots of, lots of release, right? So there, there, that's, I don't see that as defiant. I don't see that as, a, you know, he's not trying to make me look like a fool. He, the limbic brain can't do that. That's neocortex uh, brain function. So they're not trying to take advantage of you. They're not, they're not trying to make you look goofy or, or anything, he's just trying to find safety, and, you know, all he thought was, man, I'm probably going to get some safety if I uh, scoot over here to the other side of this pen, and you see that the reality is, is it's not true, because I just followed him right over there, and eventually was able to get that rain, and we just go right back to this, so this is also why it's so important to be gentle and soft with the horse, because all he's looking for is safety, so if he's feels like he's got to go move his feet to find some safety somewhere else in the pen well it's like that's that's not a true thought sorry my cameraman is going all over the place he must be getting set up to get a little bit more comfortable himself but um yeah all well, they're looking for safety so if they can always find gentle if you can always offer the gentleness and then the proper release well, then they start to realize that they can do hard things and 
things that they, you know, thought were going to compromise their safety. And then confidence is what you get in exchange of that. And so gentleness, kindness, meekness, you know, empathy, those are critical emotions for, you know, for true horsemen. Maybe not even, maybe they're not even emotions. We might just, the ancient Greeks would call them virtues. I think modern day uh, psychologists call them uh, character strengths, character virtues. And so it's so important for the horseman to have those. And when we have those, that means that we're not going to complain. See, if you complain, then something is, uh, you know, then something wasn't uh, wasn't doing what it ought to have done. And so if it's not doing what it ought to have done, then I'm going to blame it. So if you just don't complain, then you'll avoid blame. And... You can never blame a horse because they're just trying to find safety and just giving you the very best that they can. They don't have that prefrontal cortex to try to manipulate or deceive or anything like that. So he's just giving the best he can and he's softened. So no complaining means no blaming. And if you're not blaming, well then that means it's enough. And so then there's no shaming. Shaming, you know, according to Brene Brown, just says that uh, something is not enough. So the way to uh, avoid complaining is just to be grateful. Right? It's pretty hard to complain about something you're grateful for. And uh, if you find it's difficult to be grateful for the horse running off on you like that, or you know, just in the behavior that they're exhibiting, well, all we need is just a little bit more empathy because if we could just have some empathy for them, well, then we may not, we may not uh, necessarily be grateful that we're walking all over the pen to try to find him or he can't keep his feet still or whatever. But if we got empathy for him, it's, you know, that, that will shut down the complaining, the blaming and shaming. So gratitude and empathy just become absolutely critical for being a good horseman. And if he can find safety, this is this is why he's not running off. Right? I walk away and and uh, eventually I'm going to keep holding on to the to the reins, but I like seeing, you know, what do I really got? I can't remember what horseman it was. It was maybe Ray Hunt, Tom Dorrance, something like that said uh when you let go of the reins, all that you have after that is the truth. And I think the truth is that he just feels safe where he's at. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. And we get that release proper. Then uh, see him take that step into me. You know, towards me, face up a little bit. That means something. What we're really trying to do is show the horse that uh, safety comes from within. You know, he can move all around. But, you know, that's not going to get him. It's not going to get him anywhere. Because I'm just going to keep showing up. Right? So we can't run from our problems. Doesn't mean that the problems are easy to be dealt with. And that's why empathy's so critical. I think we've all had challenges and problems that we wish we could get away from and they just don't seem to get away and that's that's a good sign that there's something that needs to be taught something that needs to be learned so one one metaphor I've come to use over the years is that a good horseman is just the truth teller of the horse because the horse is a limbic a limbic creature he's He's going to operate off of, uh, see, he he just, my knee touched up there, and he's self-regulated. And so I found that threshold, waited for him to self-regulate, and then released. 
But if a good horseman is the truth teller of the horse, because the horse is a limbic, got this real powerful limbic survival mo- brain, and uh, that means that you know inside an 800 900 pound horse inside any horse they feel emotionally like a church mouse and so when you get these mustangs you know all your they don't see themselves emotionally and mentally they don't feel as magnificent as they look on the outside the inside is more like a church mouse and so you've got to build that confidence up which requires creating stimulus and creating circumstances, you know, that they feel is compromising their safety and their well-being. And, you know, once he self-regulates and then that steps away, all of a sudden he starts to learn. He's a lot more uh, capable, a lot more powerful, a lot more magnificent than what he originally might have thought he was. So then their feet will stand still and you'll start to get a willing partner. Well, that's because you got a good truth teller. Right? It's like, gosh, wouldn't it be nice to have a good truth teller in our own lives to be able to have empathy and gratitude for us while helping us realize just how magnificent and strong and powerful each of us are. So that's really what's in my mind and what I'm trying to help the horse come to understand safety is within it's not outside it's not somewhere else in the pen it's it's wherever you are and i want to make sure that that's a true thing for the horse when he's around me that's what the release of the stimulus does you know there's a big difference between releasing the stimulus at the right time and the for the right reason in the right way rather than desensitizing a horse I know a lot of people use that word, and I've used that word before too. Sometimes it just kind of falls out like it's the right word, but I'm not a big fan of desensitization just because you're desensitizing, meaning you're just doing something over and over and over until the horse loses its sensitivity. That desensitizing, right? Desensitivity. I don't want to desensitize a horse, I want that horse to be as sensitive as he was the day that I bought him, or in this case with the Mustang, the day I adopted him. So I don't want to desensitize him and remove his sensitivity from him. What I want to do is build his confidence and keep that sensitivity. And if you've got empathy and gratitude, I mean, you're a pretty sensitive person yourself, and so you don't want life's difficulties desensitizing you. You just want to be confident in it. In those difficulties. So you see we just keep working on this. I mean I think this video is about an hour long. But we're just. one. What we do to one side we do to the other. So right here I'm just putting some weight on there. I want awkward weight. Right. I'm not trying to stand perfectly in that saddle if you stand perfectly in the saddle you shouldn't even have to do the girth right you should be able to step in step straight up swing your leg over and not even have your your girth done up but here i would rather it's the old saying you know make the right thing easier and the wrong thing harder well i want you to keep your feet still when i stand properly in the saddle so can you keep your feet still when I stand improperly in the saddle? If you can keep your feet still when, I, when I'm putting a little awkward weight, kind of just being awkward and clumsy about the whole dang thing, well, then when I go to step in the saddle and I do it the proper way, it's, it's going to feel a heck of a lot better and be a heck of a lot easier. And, and I'm going to have total trust if he was able to self-regulate when I was doing it all klutzy and clumsy-like. Right. So that was fantastic just because, I mean, he's never had anybody on his back before. This is the first time, you know, he's three and a half years old.
this was the the outcome that I was hoping for. I had set the outcome in my mind and in my meditations, I guess, that uh, we'd I'd be able to put the first ride on him by the time we had spent 24 hours working together in the pens and teaching him his magnificence. But I think the critical part about that is that uh, getting in the saddle within 24 hours of working together was not my goal. Making sure that he felt safe and understood his magnificence, that was my goal. That way I'm always looking for his self-regulation, for his softness. And I'm always willing to release on it, no matter where I'm at, no matter what's going on. So if I make that my goal, well, then maybe the outcome could be that within 24 hours we could, you know, be on our first ride together. I think, I think it, I had actually gotten saddled by the time we hit 23 and a half hours, maybe 24 hours. But I think it's important to make sure that uh, our goals and our, our results don't get confused. I know a lot of times I've used those two terms synonymously, but the reality is, is that they're not synonymous. You know, the goals are those little things, almost imperceivable things that uh, lead to good outcomes. And outcomes are just your results. So the results are the results and the goals are the goals and they're not they're not the same. Let's see there's not a lot of softness in his in his hindquarters, right? That's kind of tapping on it and putting a little little pressure, a little stimulus back there and he he resists it. And that's probably to be expected at, you know, this early stage in the game. That kind of stuff will will work its way out and We'll just continue doing this. So you see, keep that nose tipped in. That way, just in case he needs to, you know, step off, if he just has it in his mind that safety's somewhere else other than where we're at right now, well, he's just going to go in a circle. You know, obviously, they can, they're going to move in the direction of their nose is pointed. see if that nose wouldn't <clears throat> excuse me if that nose wouldn't have been tipped in you know he would have stepped out forward and those would have been our first steps together and that could he could end up taking me to the rodeo much sooner than I mean I don't ever want to go to the rodeo uh, like I'm not a bronc rider at all I don't want to be one I don't think it's good for the horses it's definitely not good for the humans when you come out of the saddle you know, my, my West, who, who I'm at his place right now, is such an amazing human being. You guys should all go subscribe to his uh, YouTube channel. He's got some great videos, too. But uh, he, his his saying was that he'd never been bucked off the horse. He'd only come out a little sooner than he expected. I just thought that was a pretty funny saying. But now I'm just going to move my legs around. I just want to keep that nose tipped in. You know, what I'd really like to see here, which we're seeing right there, is you see he was standing in a real awkward position, so his his legs weren't like really solidly underneath him. Which means he's not gonna hold that pose for a little bit, so he is gonna he is gonna move around until he can find some some comfort. <clears throat> but he's gotta be able to figure that out. You know, that's a part of self-regulating. And I just... I just want to get as loud and as clumsy and goofy as I possibly can while I'm sitting up here and just make sure I have that nose tipped in because if he's going to move... Again, what we want is a horse that keeps his feet still, but more than that I want a horse that can self-regulate if you get a horse that can self-regulate the outcome will be that he can keep his feet still all 
right? And I'm just waiting for him to stop pulling against that that bit. And so there's a fine balance. This is this is real difficult stuff, kind of stuff more you got to feel and experience rather than observe and listen to. But <clears throat> it's like if he's going to be leaning on on the bit and you know putting some pressure on there then and I can't get him to soften up to it, you know, then I'm going to get a little bit more loud. So I'm going to move a little bit a little bit more so that when he does you know when he does come in come in and he does soften then I can just quiet my seat down. But if I can't get that nose to to tip in, sometimes they'll call it nose to toes. If I can't get that that nose to come in and when I give him his head, you know, and then he all of a sudden jumps off on me, meaning he just starts moving his feet real quickly and that can turn into, that can escalate real quick. And so I just want to make sure that if that does happen, I've got at least enough suppleness to be able to bend that nose into into my toes. Or the technical term is lateral flexion. I think it was Buck Brenneman that said uh, he'd never ride off on a horse that he didn't have just superb lateral flexion with. I think I could have done a better job at uh, working the right side of this lateral flexion instead of just bending him to the left this whole time. I think if I go back in time, I would, I would have uh, bent him over, right? So, all of that, even saw that nose come, come straight forward and even over to the right. That that's how hard he was, resisting and pulling, pulling against that. But you can also see, it's more of a question of, am I safe rather than. I've got to get out of here because he's still keeping his feet still. He just, they, sometimes I just got to figure out what is by doing things that are not. Um, I think the proper word for that is apophatic, meaning I can learn who I am because I know who I'm not. Well, how do you get to know who you're not? Probably by doing things you ought not to. And then you just learn from that experience, right? So, hmm, probably better not do that anymore. As a part of, uh, not this video, but as, as a part of leading up to this video, we had, we had done a lot of lateral flexion or this tip in the nose in on both sides while I was standing on the ground. So I think, I think there's uh, some times that he's getting, he's getting soft and he's releasing and or meaning he's coming into me and I'm not releasing. Um, thinking back on it, I don't think he was really quite ready for this long of having his nose bent in. So, you know, there were times that we would I'd have his nose bent in for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, and you know you, you work that up incrementally to give it to me real soft you know for a second doesn't mean I really fully got your mind so I'm going to incrementally increase the time that you know I want your nose to be bent in if your nose can be tipped in in a comfortable way for you know a couple of minutes 
well then when I need to tip your nose in for a couple of seconds, it's going to be way easier for you. So he he had been prepared for that, but I think I could have given him some better releases just in this last couple of minutes, looking back on this video. I suppose that's the other journey of horsemanship is you're always learning, you're always fine-tuning. This is, this is like... A, you know, any athlete's going to go back and watch film. So, we ride with a martingale, and the martingale had been uh, connected up to the bit. So you know how the, those martingales will connect to that little ring that's on the breast collar. And so Wes is just coming over to uh, connect that that martingale up. She's taking it off the bit and making sure it's not twisted or anything like that. Great kudos to River, though, for, I mean, this is his first time having anyone in the saddle, and he's got two people standing right next to him, you know, and these these Mustangs, they, uh, they're just so concerned about their safety right and they find safety by using their feet so fighting they're going to use their feet to fight flighting they're going to use their feet to run from their problems and even frozen um you know they're going to freeze with their feet hence why they always say the you know the weight of the horse's mind is through his feet and so for river to just keep his head low and his tail's just swishing nice and soft and he's been soft now I think it's uh, important to note that the only thing I'm doing and it's the only thing I have done the entire time that I've spent with River to get him to the cue to move your feet forward is a cluck so while I'm up here, I'm not uh I'm not squeezing my feet. I'm keeping everything extremely still. What I want to do is hold mane and rein. I don't want to steer, so I'm not going to be steering him. He's going to just be able to move his feet forward wherever he wants to take them. Uh, you know, if it if too much adrenaline, too much uh, cortisol starts running through him, he starts getting anxiety about his safety, you know, then I can tip his nose in and do a one rein stop. So you see me loving on him. Now, we've got a couple other Mustangs that are tied up, you know, to the other side of that fence right there. And so River's finding his safety. He's been there almost the entire time. And so, you know, it's that uh, oxy oxytocin that he's a herd animal right just like we are we like being in our families and so his his confidence um his self-confidence with this ride is kind of dependent on him being around two things <clears throat> one this gate that's right there and uh also these these other horses that uh see you'll notice that he stopped all i did there is just cluck Right, so kind of shot off a bit. And so I just rub on him and love on him. And so I'm not trying to move my feet, trying to put leg pressure or anything like that. It's it's just a cluck. Now I am going to uh, eventually use the, uh, oh, the popper on the end of my reins. But I don't think that's... I don't think that comes for a little bit. So hands are mane and rein. I've just got a big chunk of his his mane while I'm holding the reins. And this is he's just the direction that you see him walking, the speed that you see him walking, this is all his choice. <laughs> and I just want to honor that choice. I want to make that all as nice and feel as soft as everything can feel i want to be for this early stage i just want to cluck and have him move his feet 
Now, I have never asked him to move his feet without clucking first. So some people will, their formula for riding is squeeze the legs, then cluck, then they'll use their popper. And uh, a lot of times they'll use it like on the hindquarters. So they'll take that that end of the rein and uh, swing it back to the the hindquarters and kind of pop them back there. I don't do that. I think that takes us, that has a tendency to take the rider out of balance. And so mine is my f- little formula, if you will, or my uh, equation is cluck, squeeze, pop. And so right now it's just cluck. And you see, he's just wandering around finding his safety, right? Wherever he's going to go is where he thinks his safety is going to be. And so he just keeps going back to the gate. He keeps going back to the horses that are tied up right there. And he's just going to keep coming back to them. And for a moment, you know, for a few minutes, we're going to do this. That's going to be fine. I want him to find as much safety as he can possibly find while we're moving around. I'm going to eventually ask him to uh, move a little farther out. So just that, that threshold, right, is just going to increase. I'm going to ask a little more of him and a little more of him and a little more of him. And that's going to show up in distance away from his friends and away from the gate. It's also going to show up in in uh, the speed of him walking. So we eventually want to get to a trot. We eventually want to get to a canter. And uh, you see he's just doing these little shorts. So I'm asking him, hey, step out, go forward. So clucking right here, see him shaking, see he's got his low a low head. And then he can make it bow right there. And then he feels like he's gotta turn. And he's gotta go back to his buddies, because that's where safety is. That's fine, there's no blaming or shaming. His nose is pointed forward, so I'm gonna keep asking. And now he can make it this far. And then he feels like, oh my gosh, I've gotta turn around and I've gotta walk back to my back to my friends because that's where my safety is and so I just as soon as we get over to the friends now instead of doing any stops or anything like that I'm just going to keep clucking and asking him to go past his friends so he can go back towards his friends as many times as he wants but we can't do any more stopping I don't want the release to be by the friends otherwise I'm just going to encourage hanging out next to his friends again safety comes from within not not from anything on the external or on the outside. And so this is just a way to show him that incrementally. So you notice he's just going right to the edge of that gate. And we're just walking. So now I'm asking a little bit more, right? Like putting a little more life in my cluck. And you see that tarp hanging down. So he's now kind of making his way out to the tarp when he used to not be able to do that now it's just me clucking to ask go past your friends and he interpreted that cluck as a it, it's not that he interpreted it as let's go trot it's just trotting is now what he feels like he needs to do to find his safety and i'm not gonna see now we'll walk just a little bit past the tarp I'm not going to complain or blame or shame what he feels like he needs to do because eventually I want him to trot. So I want to be grateful for what he's going to give me. I just want him to do it while he's self-regulating. Now he's stepping out towards the middle of the gate. So paying attention to where he's walking and how far out he's walking and the speed he's walking. This all gives you an indication of how he's feeling emotionally. See, he had to turn right there. He couldn't even get halfway to that tarp. And so I just kept asking him, just kept clucking then all of a sudden he turned now as soon as he starts walking out here i stop i stop clucking i i start shutting down so then that starts feeling even more safe and then he get 
gets over here by his friends and I start talking to him and you know I'm trying to get a little bit louder and he walks away from his friends and I'm going to get a little bit quieter and softer and so then he's going to say man I can get this guy to stop talking to me by just walking away from my friends and then I start feeling safer and then safety starts expanding from beyond his friends See, that trot, this trot is just emotional insecurity. Right, so they call this Buddy Sour. Notice, though, he's just walked out past uh, past that gate. So he's getting farther on this right side. He's getting farther out on this left side. We've been all the way out to that blue tarp. Sometimes it's really short. Right? He doesn't walk off as much. And that's just a part of trying to decide, like, how much stimulus do I add to uh, get him to move those feet. Eventually, um, you know, I'm going to pick that popper up. Yeah, there it is. See, I'm talking to the shoulders. I don't swing. I want to stay in in uh, the rider's groove, and I want to stay in balance, and so... I'm going to talk to the front shoulders to get the front forward movement instead of the hind quarters. I think it's I think you get better movement. I think you get smoother movement if you talk to those front shoulders. See, so now I'm just going to be asking a lot more of him. So, he got 10-15 minutes of being able to just walk slowly back and forth from the gate to the tarp and expand his horizons and build his confidence a little bit. But I don't think we'd get much more than what we got unless we started, at, uh, you know, bringing in a little bit more uh, stimulus. Now, notice I skipped because we're not trying to steer and we're not trying to, like, teach proper cues. We're just trying to get movement and build confidence. So I skipped the leg squeeze so my legs are very still and I'm not trying to put any pressure on them if anything I'm just trying to wiggle them around so I'm going to cluck I'm just going to barely pick that popper up you know I'm not riding a seasoned barrel horse or anything like that so sometimes all you got to do is just barely barely move that popper and that'll they'll pick that up in their vision their peripheral vision and and they'll start going all you need is more forward movement so if you get more forward movement because you just barely move that popper well then that was enough so the see his head so he's like really trying to think when their head goes down they start thinking I want him to think about things now one thing they can do before they buck is that they'll like tip their nose way down by their down by their feet and kind of put their nose between their legs and that can be a sign of you're about to go to the rodeo so you want a low head but you know, that even has its boundaries, too. You'd watch those ears and... That'll just give you, you know, the indication of how he's feeling. So he, whatever we did, we pushed that thing off. I think we knocked something off. and He did pretty well for having that, that fall off. An emotionally secure horse is a physically safe rider. So a lot of people get real focused in on behavior. Stimu see how soft I'm using that rain, that uh, little popper on my rein? I'm just kind of 
I'm just flopping it as little as I have to. So how you build emotional security within the horse is this principle of do as little as possible, but as much as necessary. And so you got to feel that, you know, Ray Hunt and those Tom Dorrance, those early guys, Monty Foreman, they would say you, you got to follow the feel. So you're doing what, what it feels. Notice now he's, he's coming out even further way past the gate so now we're we're expanding you know our distance away from the friends but also um you'll see sometimes he trots away from the the rail right so he's moving outside the rail so even that is telling us that he's starting to develop some emotional confidence and I can I can give him all the credit that he's getting that he's building his emotional confidence and he's gaining that simply because I'm not trying to steer him. So all the movement that we see is the movement that he's feels confident enough to do. See how much further we I mean we walked two lengths out past that uh past that tarp. So when he turns into uh notice I just got a big chunk of mane and so I got mane and rain. Holding on to that mane will help you stay in position if if uh something goes funky. So as soon as he starts walking back towards his friends, I use the popper to uh just get a little bit more movement out of him. When he's away from his friends, I don't use the popper. I'm not clucking. So right here, I'm just quiet and I'm still. And then he turns around and then I start clucking and um, I'd start using using the popper. So if you want to be next to your friends, that's fine. You're just going to have to burn a few more calories. And if you don't want to burn calories, well then walk away from your friends and then things will get nice and quiet and feel real good and safe see that head drop down that was nice again this is just this is him so he decided to stop you know I don't want him stopping I want those feet moving all the time a walk or a trot just because sometimes stopping and getting everything started up again it can kind of be like an old an old engine that that backfires and uh it's not too fun to drive but if you can just keep that movement going you can keep that brain engaged you can keep that thinking that thinking brain activated and so with that thinking comes self regulation So now I'm going to expand asking him to uh, asking him to uh, walk out a little bit further. So I'm going to pretend like that gate is his friend as well as his other little horse buddies over there. Right, so just mane and rain. Just letting him be him. And again, this is our our first ride. We've spent about 23 hours training together. And uh, to get this kind of a ride out of it. Gosh, the thing you want is like. You want this first ride with a wild Mustang to be the most boring thing you've ever done.
it just stays the same thing. Where it, there's no reason to change anything up for this particular ride. See that saddle pad move. I mean, he's walking so close to that rail. I notice he stopped and turned at the gate, didn't go back to his friends. That's just because of the consistency. He's starting to put it together. Every time I go back to back to these guys, I spend more calories. Right? It's like, you can go back to them as much as you want. That's fine. You're just going to trot. You're just going to expend more calories. I think this is true about all horses, but the Mustangs, I think it's really true, is that uh, they are so efficient with their calories. I mean, they're working 14, 15, 16 miles a day to get enough food and and water for the day. These guys know how to be really sufficient to make sure they can make it to their next meal and make it to their next watering hole. And so they don't want to spend any more calories than they think they have to because they know that that could that could be the difference between life and death I notice he's now made it all the way over to this gate this is a 60 foot round pen see how I see I'm trying to be soft but I'm gonna I'm gonna do as much as necessary so you can see I softly picked that popper up softly swung it to both sides of the shoulder but then I added a little bit more life to it because that's just what he needed but you want to phase into that see he he made this he he made that last turn right there, which is important because I picked that popper up and had had him start going, and then now look where he wants to stop. We're on the complete opposite end of the uh, the side that his friends are on, so I'm not going to do anything here. I'm just going to love on him, be super quiet, be like, "Yep." I mean, he couldn't be further away from his friends than right now. And so this is where he gets to rest and relax and not burn any calories and just get loved on. And uh, and that, that's just because emotionally we're helping him that when he's stepping away from his friends, there's two things you can feel. You can either feel connected in solitude to yourself and to everything that's around you, or you can feel alone. And if you feel alone, you're going to have anxiety but if you can start having your own inner security and inner confidence, you know, then then you could start enjoying some solitude. And then that, you know, opens up and inspires us to start building a good solid relationship together because, you know, as we're we're building building this connection together, then he's going, Man, this guy may not be as bad as uh you know, as bad as I was I was thinking. And I know Wes asking me some questions about how that felt and everything. This this guy was my first Mustang, and so, you know, I'd been on a lot of domestic horses, but I'd never gone through this initial starting process with with a with a wild horse, and and so I'm I think I'm just giving some feedback. So hopefully I'm not like over talking on myself, and you can't really hear anything that's being said. And, either commentary but yeah this I think this is pretty much where we end this ride and hopefully this this made sense it's been a while since I looked at this video but I just kind of woke up this morning and I thought you know what I ought to do is start uploading these maybe they help somebody out or you know or maybe it's just good for me to just watch game film if you will but uh Anyways, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's probably everything, and probably just a few other things to kind of recap. Uh, some of my favorite principles is an emotionally safe horse is a physically safe rider, 
I think that's real critical. Hopefully we demonstrate how to how to get that. I think I think the principles that uh, you saw as we were working through that, it just it always remains the same. You just simply start asking a little bit more and a little bit more and Rivers gosh, we've packed all over the place. He's been a pack horse. He's done phenomenal with that. I put new riders on him now go all over the place he's climbed some incredible mountains some very technical rides as well as just like rides to the maverick gas station um i've got an instagram account just hugh vale and uh that uh i post pictures of riding him to maverick it's just right around my corner from my house so yeah, an emotionally secure horse is a physically safe rider. That's that's uh, just been so true. Nothing matters more to me than making sure that uh, he feels emotionally safe and knows that safety comes from within. Um, I think another thing too is just to just be grateful and. And uh, if there's nothing that you can see to be grateful for, then just have empathy and see that all all he's ever really doing is just trying to find where safety is at. That's why they move their feet. I don't believe they move their feet for any other reason, unless you're asking them to. Here I'm just getting off, um, right? So I'm just kind of checking everything and making it sure he just feels good with with everything I don't know what I'm saying there but I love that uh, River feels safe enough you know to be able to just stand there and uh, and I love that saying that that uh, when you put the reins down all you have is the truth <laughs>